Hello, duckies and dice fiends. Welcome to Cataclysm Prevents Table Talk Tuesday. I am one of your co-hosts, Kate Purcell. I am here with my usual co-host, that side, David Lee. And we got a we got a very special guest here today. And I am very excited to introduce you. But uh, first off, David, who the heck is you and what the heck is we doing here? Hi, I'm David, I think, at least today. And welcome to the Chaotic Wholesome Presents Table Talk Show, where every week we talk about TTRPG stuff, how to be a player, how to be a better GM, how to be a better person, um, how to be better at all the things that you want to be better at, all with a focus on intersectionality and inclusion so that everybody can have a good time. And I'm Kay. Y'all know me. I'm here a lot. Why is StreamerBot still not open i feel Sorry, like streamer bot is is a combination of like arcane demonic magic and like like pre-bible demons like the bad it's, ones it is it it is an artificer thing right the artificer who made it knows exactly how to use it the rest of us it's a, it's a little bit if okay so things should be behaving nicely now your your auto shout outs you should be appearing on screen when you talk in chat i apologize it wasn't doing that earlier streamer bot should be behaving now so hi i am Kay. i'm your other co-host at least there we go we got that happening um and gods what am i up to um Tomorrow, new episode of the Emergency Power Podcast. Y'all, some stuff is going down. And I'm just, we are here to talk to Dejus and learn about Blungeon. But y'all, I'm a trading card. And that's amazing. Emergency Power Podcast for the two-year anniversary has put out second run of three cards. And if you would like one, all you have to do is reply. Of course, it's, it's showering me. Why is it? Anyhow. All you have to do is reply to that Twitter, that tweet and let them know and we will dm you and get your address and send you series two emergency power podcast including soul my little my little terror is a trading card um so and of course as always anything you can do to interact with that or our tumblr which is also emergency power podcast uh is very appreciated you will find a new episode there on wednesday starfinder homebrew um i am gonna be shiny hunting on tuesday the last probably one before Tears of the Kingdom, and then we know what's going to happen to my soul. T Thursday. Thursday. <clears throat> look, look. Time yeah. is a weird soup. It's very Jeremy Bear Me up in here. David, you're going to be on um, doing your Overwatch thing, hopefully, yep. I assume. Yep. And um, I'm going to be Monday on Mimics and Misfits channel doing some more Starfinder with Kai, who keeps doing all the bad things. But that's enough about me. That's not what we're here for. Welcome, Tejas, to the stream. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm Tejas. I'm Tejas Oza. Uh, I'm one of the uh, co uh, creators for the Bludgeon TTRPG system, and I guess I'm the guest today. You are. So, this is really cool. We t we we've been really fortunate. We've gotten to talk to a lot of creators. Um, we've had lots of guests from the UK. I think you are our guest in the farthest time zone. Yeah, I, I'm still in the UK right now. Uh, I okay. moved here for uh, work about a year and a half ago, but still, yeah, uh, close to a far time zone. Okay, yeah, our guest last week was also in the UK time zone. Was like, I can do eleven. I can. It's yeah. a little late, but I can do it. So at least I know what time zone it is for you. Yeah. Um, but yes, tell us a little bit, you know, about who you are, and tell us about Blungeon because. I'm really excited to learn about this. Sure thing. Uh, so, I'm a game developer. Uh, I've been uh, a game designer for about 10, no, 12 years now. Uh, mostly in India. Uh, and like I said, I just moved to the UK a uh, year and a half ago. Uh, I've worked in a lot of different capacities. Mobile, uh, indie, double A, and now bits of triple A. Um, so, that's been a ride. And while I was doing all of that, uh, my buddies and I, uh, who we all met at our, my first company like over 10 years ago, um, 
at some point we just started uh, creating homebrew rules and uh, I mean they were a massive departure from what we were playing anyways and during the pandemic uh, just on a whim I was like oh, I've got all these notebooks and like uh, I used to put all the rules up on a blog that just the four of us could look at and I was like let me put them all into a single word doc and was, as soon as I did I was like shit this is like 180 pages wow so <laughs> Yeah, at that point we were like, maybe we should try publishing this. And then that was an interesting decision because we've learned a lot since. <laughs> and um, so you're, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, JD says that's a lot of typing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be fair, it's typing over like a uh, 10 year period. So. Uh, we did it in verse and sprint, uh, sprints uh, whenever some inspiration took us or like someone posed a new question. It was like, hey, what if we, how, how would we do this? Or how would we make this class work? Because at the core of it, uh, it was how to make combat more engaging. Uh, and that's what we were trying to do with our homebrew rules. Uh, I think the core problem statement that we were trying to solve for was I don't like the fact that. I just have to say fireball and it's almost like hitting a key on your keyboard right just saying fireball yeah. fireball fireball and that's boring uh i don't feel like a wizard when i do that so why can't the mechanics make you feel like you're a wizard and that's what we were trying to solve for david and i played a game where we kind of had pre-made auto assigned characters except for me i got to be special um but David was assigned the orc barbarian. And I think the comment was like, I show up to hit the, I show up and press the hit button. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's precisely what we don't like. Uh, I think right now, uh, the, what we've given out for free has the arcane in the martial system. So even there, like the way uh, the fighters work is a lot more engaging. I, or at least I'd like to think so. Uh, it's at least fun for when we were playing it internally and with uh, some of the playtesters we've had since. Uh, there's a lot more that you do and the way we kind of structure the abilities is it, it, it kind of fits the archetype. So when you do an action, it bleeds into the roleplay and vice versa. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's really cool. Like. Uh, I think uh, the, the hilarious bit is actually just the, the first conversation we had about it, which was, and I know we were probably like a little drunk at that point. Uh, we had uh, been at a friend's place uh, to play, I think it was Call of Cthulhu, but <laughs> the week before we had just finished like a mini uh, session uh, where I had uh, been DMing. And we were just talking about how uh, uh, my friend Nilish, he was, uh, he had been playing a bar and he was like that was just boring like i didn't feel like i was actually singing i didn't feel like i was doing anything bard like apart from saying that i was doing something bard like but at the end of the day what i did is the same as what a wizard could do or a sorcerer could do more or less barring a few passives and so i was like yeah that is that is something and i went home and i thought about it and then i think like Within a few days, I was like, what if we did this? And came up with this whole spell casting and crafting system. And um, so this is a D20 based system? Yes, it is. Uh, we, at the time we were playing uh, Dungeons and Dragons. And so we kind of jumped off of from there. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is we didn't know that other things existed um, for a very long time did not know uh hell the fact that DD existed was uh uh quite a revelation uh because uh i i had i hadn't even conceived that dice with more than six die uh sides was possible till i was like you know what 16 years old or something <laughs> so yeah amazing and um just you know from looking at the art, looking at the quick start, a lot of this seems to also be based around um, the heritage and folklore of India. Uh, kind of, yeah. I th I'd say maybe uh, it it's more like inspired by. I, okay. I, th I like to think of it as 
uh, you don't see uh, like Wizards of the Coast saying, "Hey, check out this Norse mythology inspired Dungeons and Dragons system." Right. It just is, and we all grew up in India, so we wanted to to look a way that we like and that we feel uh, was like approachable to us. So we've basically only worked with artists uh, out of the country. Um, uh, finding people to work with has also been uh, a fun process as well. So yeah, um, that's kind of how I like to look at it. It is uh, less like, oh yeah, we're yeah, telling this specific story and just more like, this is what it looks like for us. Yeah. But if you want to look different, go ahead. Well, it's also... I think great and refreshing because even though I do love me some like some European based fantasy, there's a lot of European based fantasy out there and it's kind there of is. nice to, to, you know, get something fresh and different. Yeah. It's, it, it's something that we always see is that it's, it's always, it, it's always this sort of same sort of rapper. Uh, and I think the most exotic that it gets is maybe Greek mythology and even there it kind of gets uh altered quite a bit um but yeah it's just nice to see something that we're familiar with where we're like oh yeah that's a reference i get when one thing i i like is so everyone's accustomed to like sort of western european centric with like elements of and flavors of other cultures like i think of um diablo and the prime evils yeah like you know there's 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 heaven and there's hell but then there's Mephisto, who's not like a traditional like christian demon that you hear like it's usually like the devil yeah. and god and the end um but it's refreshing to see like a non-western civilization centric game mm -hmm. that has that that borrows elements from other places so like i get to see a luchador in yeah. an indian based game and that's cool that that stance specifically came about because of uh, one of our players was like i want to be a wrestler and not just any kind of wrestler uh it, so in India, our kind of uh, local version of wrestling is called Kushti, right? Uh, and a lot of what the dude is wearing in that specific image is what they wear, which is literally just a loincloth and uh, it's wrestling in a sand pit uh, to really just kind of simplify it. Uh, but we like we grew up with references from all over the world, so we're like mm -hmm. that. But we also like luchadors, so let's mix it. Uh, so you're gonna see like a weird mix of like a lot of stuff that like if you're indian you'll be like oh wait i know what that is and bits and pieces from everywhere uh it's kind of the fun fun part of like growing up in uh like uh, just surrounded by tons of different media okay just i'm so sorry the captioning yeah. thing is misbehaving um, um i'm gonna send you the link again if you will just sure. click it again thank you jd for pointing that out um Software is great so long as it behaves. David, will you say a thing to see if you're? Yeah, I'm curious if my oh mine is okay. working. Yours is behaving. It All just right. gets moody sometimes, y'all. Like, I just imagine someone took a uh, like a pair of those bug zapping gloves, and then like grabbed a demon, and then like smushed it down into software, <laughs> and then. Like between streamer bot and pixel chat, like that's 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 how those two got made. Yep, sounds about right. Um, and I think I'm back up and running. Yes, so sorry. Um, no you were talking about um, you grew up with uh, influences from everywhere. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, so for me specifically, like clearly, I don't sound uh, typically Indian, and that's because uh, I think the first eight, ten years of my life were spent in California. And then my mm. family moved back to India, uh, mm -hmm. and we, I grew up there for the rest of my life, uh, but somehow the accent stuck. Uh, but 
not just that, but I came back to India in like about 98 and those early 2000 periods, uh, there's a lot more uh, Western influence coming into the country. Uh, in the 90s, our economy had opened up. Uh, for those of you who are interested in history, uh, we basically went from the state owning like 80% of everything to them kind of loosening their hold on stuff. And uh, that kind of started the boom in our economy. But what that means for me and pop culture is we got a lot more Western TV alongside all the other stuff that we had. So yeah, we all grew up with like all kinds of references from or uh, and media from all kinds of stuff. And it, that's so, yeah, our touch points are varied and wild. And, um, you know, you talked about being game dev. I'm also in game dev and I'm working. Oh, no. Oh, no. oh you're Do back. Both. There we go. Well okay. back. <laughs> um, say something really quick just to make sure your captions are still behaving. Sure. I'll say something really quick. OK, perfect. Yeah. Um, thank you and apologies for it's everything that Miss Painting all at once. Um, so I, I noticed the game dev because you started talking about, yes, we did it in sprints and um, being working in on games myself um you know specifically i'm working on a game that is set in a fictional southeast asia but it means we got a crash course on exactly how much people and things move around in that area of the world too so yeah. it's not like these were very isolated spaces like it very much makes sense for that part of the world it does uh we're like i i the cultures are just crazy and uh, i think that's why i if anybody tries to point out that like you know you're representing india and i'm like no no i'm not i can represent what i've grown up with uh and so can everyone else who's uh made this but like it, just growing up in india is, is, is so crazy because uh we're larger than europe and culturally uh we state to state we're as different as going from like uh norway to finland they're essentially different places, different ways of looking at things, different customs. And sure, there's little bits of overlap, but there's a lot that isn't. Like, I remember when uh, I grew up on the uh, west side of India in a state called Gujarat, and I moved down south for uh, college. There was sheer culture shock, and that was literally two states down. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, that those first two weeks were very, very hard because I couldn't read any of the signs. I didn't speak wow. the local language. Uh, yeah, it, it was an adjustment. Yeah, and um, we talk about that here too. Like, we can't build a game set in America that represents the experience of every American. Because yeah. even between just David and I, my experience of being America and childhood in America is so... I grew up in the backwoods in Texas. Wow. Like, I went to... Y'all, I went to... If I had gone to public school, I grew up in the same small town where Joe Exotic graduated school and was a cop. Wow. David grew up in inner city LA. So our experiences really can't be much different. <laughs> and also, I, I need to point out that Kay loves to troll people because when you say where you are, if you're not from, like, Miami or New York or, or Boston, then you'll say, oh, I am a few minutes between this large city. And, th like, if you ask me where Santa Barbara is, I'm like, oh, it's in Central California between L.A. and San Francisco. And people have a rough idea. Now, that's hundreds of miles. But they have Kay will be like, here's where I'm from. I'm between this town and this town. And you're like, where? And it's I'm like, from oh. Pilot Point, so Texas. It's between Aubrey and Tioga. Right. <laughs> and it's like, where and where? And it's like, oh, it's between these two cities. <laughs> like, like Aubrey is between these two towns that you've never heard of. And those are between these two towns you've never heard of. And then you might get near a town you have heard of. My favorite fact is that the, the town that you have heard of that is closest to where I grew up is Denton, which is the team that they played in uh, football in King of the Hill, which is an actual real town. <laughs> but yes, um, I want to yeah, ask. Uh, oh, continue. Oh, just, just one more comment is like people like much like the United States, especially people I've spoken to in Western Europe don't have any like sense of scale because 
I got into an argument with someone years ago about Indian food. And I'm like, listen, Indian food is an Indian food. And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, yeah. saying Indian food is Indian food is like saying American food is American food. And like, you know, you have like spam masubi in one place and like squirrel salad in another place. <laughs> and the diets are completely different. Exactly. And then you have the curry that is just the British version. <laughs> Right. Indian food. As I'm getting acquainted to right now. <laughs> yeah, and people are like, oh man, I love Indian food. Just just tikka masala is my favorite. I'm like, you realize that's British, right? Yeah. Like if like like British discovered spices and, and threw it in curry. And then that's how that happened. Yeah. Rex says, I hear the lobster is terrible in Montana. Right. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, so just this is more a question that Nothing, very, not nothing, but very little to do with the actual show. But um, are you at all familiar with the the show's Shikar, the upcoming Desi Quest? Uh, I don't think so. I am, I am very, very excited uh, for you to, like, maybe get involved in these. So one of my favorite GMs, that bronze girl, um, is Desi, and she runs a... Oh, wait, 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 hold up. Uh, this is uh, the all uh, Indian diaspora. That is thing. Desi Quest. Yes. Right. Uh, quick note: It's Desi. Desi. I'm sorry. It, it doesn't matter. It just it, it was it does hard matter. for me to. I appreciate. Uh, it yes. absolutely matters. Yeah, I, I did clock the clock the term for a while, but yes, in that case, I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm quite intrigued by that. Um, if you get the chance, uh, on her YouTube. Uh, and still happening every week or most every week on her uh, Twitch, she runs a home game called Shakar, where she plays. Um, it is her homebrew world that is very Desi inspired, uh -huh. um, but not like a full on. And it's uh, Gabe Hicks and Xander and like this really interesting eclectic cast uh -huh. going through this very Desi inspired world. Uh -huh. Um, so I absolutely fell in love with it because it's, you know, it's a small four person cast. So there's a lot of role playing personality, which I really love. They're really incredible performers and her NPCs are off the hook. That's no amazing. one does an NPC like bronze. Bronze's NPCs stress me the heck out in the best way. <laughs> um, but this really, it's a really fun series and I would love to um, kind of Get your feel on it. Eventually, if you get time to watch any of it, please ping me and let me know what you thought because I really love it. And it was, I learned a whole lot just getting to sit back and absorb other people going through her world. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I'll check it out and uh, I'll reach out to you as soon as I have. Uh, I mean, take I, your time. It's a, Yes, please go watch hours and hours and hours of actual play content yeah, now, right. immediately get back. No, I'm not doing that. I'm, while no, you're also uh, developing a game and a TTRPG. Yeah, no, I, I like to have something playing in the background anyways when I'm, like, thinking about something, so sounds like a good new uh, thing to set up. But, yeah, I, I, I kind of get what you mean. It's, it's really cool to see, like, new new versions of worlds and new versions of fantasy uh, come out. Uh, I think with Bludgeon, uh, I think it's also just because a lot of us are very systems-oriented. We didn't want to be too prescriptive with... Uh, with our worlds uh so we always approached it as a mechanics first type deal and i think that's just a byproduct of like i'm a systems guy the other uh, uh designer who's part of this is also very systems and technical oriented and the other two creators are programmers so we're all thinking really in terms of how it works rather than the wrapper the wrapper started coming together much later because uh, we would use the set uh these rules in like a whole bunch of different uh settings so i've run it with uh you know like a very basic inspired type uh uh world i've done like a sci-fi conversion of it uh all kinds of little bits and bobs just to stretch and pull and see if the mechanics still hold up um, so my question is, you know, all of us have a text file somewhere where we just dump stuff yeah. over time. Um, and it's a giant mess. Uh, I have one open specifically for the project that Kay and I are working on right now on my desktop. Uh, but, but 
when you decide to go from that to actually building a system, um, how long did it take you to go from, hey, we should do this, to uh, this is an actually built thing that we can release to people um, and get people playing? Okay. Um, for us, because, like I said, that we're like systems guys, the system always came first. Um, so it was built with, uh, with that in mind is that we're building it modular. So we didn't have to like, have like everything needed to all come in at once. Um, so, uh, the first question, uh, like I mentioned earlier, like the first question we asked is how can we make mages and bards and all that not suck? Uh, like feel like what it is, right? So the first question we asked is how can a bard work? And I was like, okay, so basically the player fantasy of a bard is that you're singing and you're kind of building up to this like cool power note. That's like a really nice fantasy, right? Uh, is that you do these things, you're kind of doing smaller bits of influence, and then you have this epic uh, solo operatic moment, whatever uh, rapper you want. And that's how I started the system. Is that, okay, so basically that requires that you have smaller actions that you take that will gain you something that you can then use to convert into a massive spell and then i was like okay how do you craft a spell where it's not just choosing the same option and then i was like okay what are the components of a spell it's the type of shape it takes and the element and then maybe some elemental effect and that's how i came up with the spell crafting system and with that i was like okay if i only have a spell crafting system where it's the choice of shape an element and an elemental effect how can other things interact with this so then i started coming up with like okay what how would a sorcerer work with this uh crafting system how would a wizard do the same thing and then so we would first define an archetype and like a play style and then mm -hmm. build a mechanic that works with it so uh we have umbrella terms like arcane and martial and chakra and all that and each one is basically a class type and you have subclasses that interact with that core man, but we can separately. So to get back to the uh, question, that's how we built it. So we started with Arcane, and I believe Martial and Chakra came second, and then we got to Primal and Divine. And once we built all those, and I compiled it all together, most of the game was there. All that was really mm. missing was uh, a flavor text, uh, an interesting wrapper, like a unified wrapper, because we kept bouncing around and uh, cleaning it up because there was a lot of language that uh, was fine for us uh, but you know it's not great to teach other people with so it was a lot of cleaning up and I'm still cleaning a lot of it up as well because I, I do realize that the way I think about things and the way I write things may not translate well from like technical game design into TTRPG design <laughs> Figuring out how to communicate what you're trying to communicate is one of the largest challenges yeah. out there. Mm -hmm. Says the comms so, person, who is also yeah, a Gemini. Like who to who to steal a the perfect and most accurate line from Velvet Goldmine. I live in fear of being misunderstood. But yeah, like if, if you guys are working on something, I'd say make sure that your systems are kind of working without a wrapper. And then the wrapper just kind of extends it and makes it better. Uh, so as long as what you're doing physically with your actions makes you feel a certain way, you're already on the right path. So it sounds like the system uh, is very much about um, taking steps that power up and power up to the, throughout the course of combat. Yeah. And it also sounds like while there is a wrapper, you're very much encouraging people to flavor that wrapper oh, yeah. to meet uh, whatever it is their character is playing. Yeah, uh, I, I've mentioned it in the book multiple times, and I try to give examples of how you can take what's there and still theme it in different ways. Uh, I think it just comes from the fact that because we modded a bunch of stuff, and that's how we ended up here. We built our own settings, and that's how we ended up here. Uh, I'd love to see people do the same. Uh, I think one of the next big steps for me is also to kind of put in more suggestions for how you could create your own 
versions of this or mod the content to create something that you think works better for you. Um, the, that's kind of the, the, the best thing about games is that uh, someone will create something and someone else will take it forward. That is, I spend so much time trying to explain to creators that like, yes, you've created this thing and you, you did it and it's here and now you've put it out in the world and it no longer belongs to just you. It belongs right. to everyone who has touched it, interacted with it. And what they're doing is not your version, but that doesn't mean that it's not this thing. That doesn't exactly. mean it's corrupted or lessened. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if, if at any point you think that once you've published something, it is 100% yours anymore, and your name is not Disney, then I direct you to um, <laughs> just look at AO3 and um. see how many like better versions of things, whether it be Batman, whether it be Harry Potter, where it's like, oh, this makes way more sense that yeah. have happened. So um, one, embrace it, because that means that someone is a fan enough of your work to sit down and write 127,000 words about what your characters would do if they decidedly dis uh, if they decided to suddenly kiss each other um, and um, also that they're having a great time with it. Yeah. yeah. The, the fact that you've inspired someone to like take something a step further or build something in your world or with your work or using what you've done as a fundamental that's huge. Like, you have to think about, uh, even as a creator, of all the stuff that inspired you. And what the reason you're creating is because you've done exactly that. So it's it's awesome that someone else does that for your work. Uh, and I remember um, talking to Kay when we were running one of our uh, earlier, or very early, like one of the first two or three things we ever ran. Um, and she was like, you know, the goal, the goal is to be cool enough for by people make fan art. And then just the next episode, <laughs> someone popped up with fan art on Twitter and Kay was like, I, I think, I think we've arrived. But speaking of fan art, speaking of art, I want to ask you about your artists. I always, I always want to know about artists and working with them and what your process is like. Okay, um, the process has been a, a lot of learning because uh, I had never worked with uh, freelance artists before, uh, and not directly myself. They were like I always worked in a studio environment where you go to the art lead, talk to them, and it's you know that's about it. Uh, so the first the first hurdle was kind of finding people. Uh, well, actually, the real hurdle was like uh, between. Uh, all of us creators being like, okay, how much are we willing to spend on this? Because uh, we've uh, basically just been putting in our own money into this, mm -hmm. and it's like, what, let, let's be realistic and set a limit, so we're not just like, you know, constantly putting bits and pieces here and then presenting it later. So uh, we figured out what our budget is, and then uh, started hunting around for artists. Um, one of the big things that I wanted to do was kind of ensure that whoever we work with was, uh, was in India. Uh, I think it, one thing I've noticed, and again, this is just a personal opinion, but when it comes to a lot of content that tries to mine uh, cultural touchstones from the East, a lot of it does not use or talk to or uh, work with people who are actually from the country. Uh, so I did not want to be someone who did that because I don't like it. And so, yeah, it was like trawling around uh, uh, art station and uh, uh, Instagram and uh, just cold messaging people saying, hey, I'm working on this project. I would love to talk to you about a commission. And, uh, are you open to commissions? There's a lot of really, really good artists exist in India, but not all of them are doing commissions. Uh, so... Uh, finally got a reference uh, to someone to do our cover art uh, and that was like the first big piece of art we got and I knew nothing about how to work with a freelancer so I just kind of did what I do in game studios which is hey this is the brief these are a few references uh, I learned that I also had to be a lot more precise and a lot more clear through that process but we got this fantastic cover uh, and uh, after that, uh, 
found another artist uh, named Akansha Mitra. Her art you won't see in the book that's up on itch yet, but uh, all her art is part of the chakra-based fighters, uh, and that will be coming out soon. Uh, that's essentially uh, what the the closest I can say is like monk classes. Uh, so that hopefully in the next month or so should be up on that free demo. Um, and the rest of the art that you see inside the book, uh, uh, I actually contacted an old mentor of mine who taught me uh, art in school. And he has started his own uh, uh, studio where they were doing art. And so I contracted him and uh, his team did a bunch of the uh, art that you see right now inside the book. Incredible. JD Lady says the art looks so good. And David said, yes, the backstabber is cool. Like platypus and badass oh, yeah. did not go together in my head. And I'm glad I was wrong. The, the platypus race is all thanks to my wife. Uh, she wanted that race. And I was like, yeah, I mean, at, the, at a point where like you're just writing down the rules it's like yeah i can do that right. uh <laughs> so yeah i got uh came up with uh what it was what it does what its adaptations would be and uh that's how we have the platypus platypuses are so weird and awesome and i'm so glad yeah. that they're like that venom claw yeah just, it's just... there uh that that was the weirdest thing. Like I didn't know they had that till I like did some research for uh, for the class uh, for the race, and I was like, oh okay. Uh, so all our races have these adaptations, which is like these ph physical traits that you would develop uh, naturally. So th that's an adaptation they get. Fun fact: platypuses were like banned from a bunch of like taxonomy stuff because people were convinced it was like the the fake mermaids that were like monkeys sewn onto fishes and the scientists were like no this is not real because all they were getting were you know they were getting live specimens because they were too far away and they'd get these things they're like this isn't real no go away yeah. this is a really good hack but no yeah you suit a duck bill oh, onto a beaver oh. I don't believe this oh Rex just broke David <laughs> Rex yeah. says now you could actually parry the platypus for the Phineas and Fur of oh. here do, don't don't get me started. Every playtest, every playtest <laughs> has one Perry the platypus or some version <laughs> of it. It is uh, it's too easy. It's uh, at this point I'm just like I, I've I've seen enough Perry. <gasps> so. Uh... Yeah. And uh, for, free tip, free pro tip for anyone looking to hire an artist. Um, just, and I know it's scary and I know it's terrible and I know no one wants to do it, but draw stick figure versions of what you want. I promise artists will appreciate that so much and you'll get so much closer to what you want off the first go. Everyone yeah. who's a close friend of me knows one, how bad I am at art and two, like, my historical trauma when it comes to art. So when Kay and I were like, all right, we got to make a map for this thing. And Kay's like, just draw something. I'm like, mm, not going to do it. And she's like, just draw it. The ability of an artist to take the absolute hot steaming pile of garbage that you, the, the scribbles that you put down and then turn it into something, like, gorgeous and also exactly what you want. Um... And you know, like, like everybody eats, right? You don't go to a restaurant and go, I'm hungry. And they're like, what do you want to eat? And you're like, food. Like yeah. you go and, and even if it's something like, like you go over to somebody's house, like what you want to eat and you go, I don't know, rice. It's like, okay, well that's something. I could go a direction from there. Now, are there 27,000 different types of rice? Absolutely. But it narrows it from you could be eating slime to now we're in at least a category. And the more specific you are with um, what you're asking for and um, the more clear you are in what you what what you are comfortable and willing to let the artist have for their interpretation because that's the other thing is like there's this reputation that artists like 
just want to use you as an excuse to do your own thing and that to do their own thing and that's not true like they want you to be happy with their work um especially happy enough for a repeat commission um and so they're really trying to give you what you want and if you aren't specific enough then you're not going to be happy um but you know and people who get tattoos do this all the time where they go up to a tattoo artist and be like yo what do you feel like tattooing today like i am a blank canvas but most people don't want that too want that tattoo most people want like my my grammy mildred had this funny face in this one picture and i wanted pixel perfect on my ankle um which i hope is a conversation that has not happened but still i think uh to just build on that uh another great thing uh and i failed to mention this earlier is with working for people from the same country is reference points uh that's something that people don't take uh for uh or don't take into account that often uh i could talk to an artist maybe someone from the west or any other country and be like yeah i need this guy to kind of uh look uh kind of rajasthani so that means they got to go do some research or they're going to rely on me to give them uh, a bunch of uh, references. Uh, whereas someone out here is like, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I have a general idea of what that means. And then there's like they may not need to do research or they'll do research just to verify whether their pop culture references are accurate enough or need to be adjusted. But that's a bit quicker. And that also helps. And they'll also have a familiarity with it so that they can riff off it a little bit. You know, because if you don't know something, you're like, yeah, I have to draw it like this because that's what it is. Whereas, like, if if someone says draw my cat, okay, I have to draw your cat as I see it. If I'm going to draw Gilmore, I'm going to draw him being more goofy and cute, and I'm going to draw Jareth looking nervous. Because those are my cats, and I know them. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, like, the wrestler example, my my literal brief for that was, I want... uh, a guy who does kushti wearing this luchador mask but striking a wwe pose that is and, a collision. yeah that's amazing. exactly and they got that that's that's essentially and i didn't have to give them too many references i literally just gave them that small brief and they they immediately got it um and across the board it's it's so much easier to get uh certain vibes or certain uh you know, little details that kind of get you what you want, uh, or get get the, the feeling that you're going for. Yeah, Rex says mood boards, mood boards, mood boards. A lot of mood boards. Yeah, uh, and... I did also did not realize how long it takes to build a mood board. <laughs> there are some people who can just like, no, I know exactly what I want. Pinterest done. But no, it, ta- it takes me a while because I'm like, you know, that's close. And I don't want to have to go through everything on the mood board and be like, yeah. this except silver. And okay, this, uh, uh, no, got to find the right one. Uh, JD says the, the Luchador reference, uh, awesomely specific set of notes. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and, I, I, so go ahead. Uh, oh, no, please, please continue because I will hold on to this point. Okay, I, I was just going to say, like, the, the problem with mood boards for me is I'm not super visual. Uh, I, like I said, I think in numbers. Uh, I think in how things work. So it took forever to get those like mood yeah. boards and references set up. And I'm pretty sure that they were not adequate. And yet uh, the artists just were like, yeah, don't worry. We got it. You can, So when uh, I'm going to, I'm just point to God Plane, which I know you're not familiar with. But, you know, we hired my amazing, talented friend, Cozy Spoon, to do art for God Plane. And... Um, urban bohemian is very much that same kind of like i am the character i don't think that much about what they wear he's like i don't know what my character wears unless someone commissions art for that right i know if they dress fancy or if they dress in tattered armor but that's kind of and um he literally went i'm think he sent her a photo of like i'm thinking of wearing this like vest Uh uh-huh and she incorporated that into the design and he and like oh, that the, p- pulled the color out of the vest to make like all the magic sparkle that same color and he was like yes this is great it's a waist up so i have no idea what pants he's wearing but it doesn't matter i know what he's wearing now <laughs> but yeah that, uh, helps. that that visualization is 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 very important especially when you're trying to build a more polished final looking product yeah and if you can 
give an artist, even if it's that one specific thing, it's kind of this, they're fancy, they're uptight, they'd like to be clean, and they're something like this is what they'd wear. Artists will take that and fly. JD said, I only just noticed that the orc has a guitar and flaming oh, yeah, guitar right? icon. It's cool. Yes. Um, and, you know, like, um, many people, especially in like the TTRPG space, have talked about how okay, you're building this whole thing around a culture and have talked to zero people from the culture. Like, why would you... Um, and uh, ignoring the offensiveness of that, there are two, there are two major points that um, I don't really hear people talk about enough. And one is the level of shorthand you can get with someone who has that cultural experience. Like, if like there there are people I've talked to where something in their accent, something in their cadence lets me know that we share this particular thing yeah. and that we get to going back and forth and then no one understands what we're talking about. Anymore. And that's true of where I grew up with. That's true of certain fandoms. Um, you get like a uh, uh, someone with a PhD in mathematics talking to another person with a PhD in mathematics. And so, like, there's this whole idea of specialized language within language where you can, like, I speak English, the person with the PhD in math speak English, but then can talk to me for 10 minutes and I don't understand anything they're saying. It's like, mm, I know what some of these words are. Um, and being able to have that connection makes things go a lot faster, especially when time is money. Um, in addition to that, Oftentimes, it's just as important, if not more, and more important, to know what to exclude versus yeah. what to keep. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, um, uh, Kay and I uh, go back and forth on like monsters and other sort of like creature encounters we have. I've built some like um, really cool custom things based off of different indigenous lore. And I have a friend who's indigenous. Um, and uh, has, in, in addition to being indigenous, has a lot of uh, background when it comes to like witchcraft in America and in Western Europe and in Ireland and in Mexico. Um, and so I ask specific things and I get specific, specific information so that the things I include are wrong, so that someone doesn't see what I'm making and go, well, one, they've appropriated my culture. And also so that other people don't look at it and go, oh, well, I've seen this particular instance, so I understand this thing now. Right. And it's like, no, this is specifically wrong so that no one thinks uh, that we're, we're coloring inside the lines. Like, this is, this is inspired by, but not of this particular thing. It's wrong. Don't believe this is what this is. Yeah, uh, I, I totally understand that. Uh, you, it, it's definitely something you want to be very careful for, uh, careful about, which is why I like I, I try to be very clear about this is not what I'm doing. It's literally just mm -hmm. aesthetics and stuff that we grew up thinking were cool, and just a mash of that, but in a way that we're like, yeah, I, I can recognize this. I can see yeah. the reference points. I like building, because, you know, look, I don't know if anyone here has noticed, I'm white. I'm really white. Like, my ancestors gave Never up noticed. what our culture was when they said, no, we're going to be white Americans, right? So um, I've got a lot of Russian heritage, and I know very little outside of that I really love Blumkeys, right? Because that is just the decision that my family made generations back. Um, and so... I am never going to be able to know everything. I'm never going to be able to get anything right, everything right. But even as we were talking about earlier, my experience of America and David's experience of America, very different. Yeah. So you can't, if you try to create this thing that is a perfect representation of any place, you're not going to do it simply because, hey, youngles, welcome in. Simply because that perfect, that exact experience belongs only to you. And even your parents have a different experience of that oh, yeah. place and time. The real trick is, A, like, be as respectful as you can. Don't 
like, but the real trick is just putting in little things so that someone can go, that was for me. That thing, yeah. someone who lived in this place, someone who is outside of this culture doesn't know about that, right? That's yeah. for me. Yes, probably this is built for a, we spend a lot of time talking about this in video games. Primary target audience is always going to be white. Yeah. And you make sure you put stuff in there that the white people won't get. <laughs> Not to exclude, but just to show, hey, we know we're we know we're stepping in your space. This is for you. We tried. An effort was made. It's not perfect, but it's something. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think that's 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 the most you can do. And I think what one thing that I've always talked about, especially at work too, is that um, when you've grown up outside of a Western country. There's a lot going on in terms of just people around you, uh, the stuff that you are uh, exposed to. And one thing that you definitely get an education of very early on in your life is nuance. And uh, sometimes that can uh, come across as a bit odd to like someone who's not used to it. But when you've grown up surrounded by like what five different religions and just people from different states and cultures you just there's a lot of things you just understand that hey this is cool this is fine you don't you, yeah. you let it go well, and i've i've said before you know i grew up in small town texas we were landlocked there was a lot like there was a lot of language just to be able to discuss things that i had to learn as an adult because we did not discuss race at all. Like, it was a case of, yeah, she's marrying someone. Oh. He's black. Or like, <laughs> yeah, um, we got this new housekeeper and she's great. She's Mexican. Right? Yeah. Like, it was, it was taboo to even say those things. And it took so much from young me because I genuinely felt like saying someone was of a culture was a social taboo. It was a bad thing. Uh -huh. And yeah. it kept me from having awesome discussions about what's your food? What's your cult? Tell me, teach me about yeah. you. Teach me about this thing that is part of what makes you you because it was not white. So therefore not a thing we could discuss. Um, yeah. A friend of mine um, was slash is a part of a band where the creator and lead singer of the band is Icelandic. And so I'd be sitting with him at like Old Town Pub in Pasadena, you know, um, talking trash, drinking an overpriced beer, and we um, and we talk about his country, and he'd say, "Your entire my entire country can fit inside LA County." Yeah, I bring this up because scale. Texas is gigantic, and it's so big. Texas isn't landlocked. Texas has a port. Kay is like, I lived in a place that was landlocked. That's how big Texas is. Because to be fair, uh, driving to the ocean from, from Kay's childhood home mm -hmm. is what, six hours, eight? eight you would hours. go through three biomes from where wow. I live to the ocean. That's amazing. People would be like, oh, I'm going to Austin. Can we meet up for lunch? I'm like, Austin is a six and a half hour drive if I speed. No, I'm not meeting you for lunch. Six and a half. That's at least. That's at least a twelve pack. That's that's far. Yeah. That's a, that's uh yeah that's a you're basically driving across that state or maybe halfway across that state. And there's a in there Europe, is a wonderful there is a wonderful and I I'd have to dig it out and it's wonderful and horrible for those of you who don't know I used to be a moderator at DeviantArt so this is going to tell you like this is going to make so much more sense what I'm about to say there's this wonderful post about like you know people showing scale and they were showing like this thing you know this whatever country can fit inside of Texas and there's still room to drive around it and someone replied with like yet another country has fallen victim to Texas for <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'm like, mm, this is coming real. This is coming for me. Um, yep. <laughs> yeah, you've been, you've been directly attacked. Um, but, uh, and I keep, I keep going enter the bludgeon because enter the gungeon, and it's, it's, 
It's a joke only I find funny, and that's that's how I live. My I life. got it. I smiled. I got but, it too. Um, what was your favorite part about making your system? Uh, ha- just being able to make it. Um, a lot of this came from uh, needing an outlet, right? Uh, when you work in the industry, uh, you don't always get to work on what you want or what you're super excited about, right? Uh, in India at the time, uh, and to some extent, well, still, a lot of companies do services and live ops, which means we're not building uh, games uh, or f- that we want to make because uh, that's not where the funding is. So I was with a company called Glue at the time and uh, we were basically uh, running Sunset Games, which is it was not profitable run in uh, the States, so but it was profitable run out of India. So I worked on games like that and it was really nice just to have something that was more uh, free form and like like I had more onus over so that's initially how it started and then it was just fun because uh, my buddies and I would play this uh, and we would then play it get drunk and then argue about what what did and didn't work and that was just a cycle and a way to hang out and uh, that's that's how a lot of it got built (laughs) amazing Um, so one thing I particularly like about the system is it grew the way so many um, of the things that we love in tabletop grew. Is like we were playing D and D. All these things didn't work for what we were doing. We'll do it better, and then it grew into its own system. Yeah, we basically were like, we'll do this a way that we really like, and that works for us. And that's that's what we built. And frankly, like uh, <laughs> the fact that we only knew D and D, and it's only been the last so many years where I'm like, oh wait, shit, there's way more out there. Uh, that's that's been hilarious as well because I wouldn't be surprised if some of the stuff that we thought of in our little bubble out in our corner of the world has already oh, yeah. been done. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, it has been. We were. We were just discussing last week someone who uh, was like, I want to do like uh, a game inspired by like Zelda that's very adventure heavy and that uh-huh. is like beginner friendly. And then right as they launched their Kickstarter, um, oh heck, what's the name? Break came out, which is, but like they're both, he like three times funded his Kickstarter. Oh, that's Still, funny. just because, you know, so it's, it's, we talk about this a lot, like, I don't like the phrase originality is dead because that's not really true. Originality has never really been there because we are all little pieces of things that we pick up and put together. But just because you have a story that you want to tell and someone has told, a version of that has been told before, or someone is doing something similar, doesn't mean you won't be successful and it doesn't mean you're not stealing. It doesn't mean you're like stealing, you're you're doing your own thing. and. And I'm going to say this very, I'm going to be very blunt about this, especially if you are from a minority background, <laughs> whatever that flavor is. Hey, Sauce uh-huh. Fire. Um, you, there's a really good chance that you're going to tell that story in a way that mainstream media has not. So don't be afraid to tell it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think like, I, I do want to touch upon the whole minority thing because it, it's funny because I'm not a minority in India. <laughs> I'm mm-hmm. the majority there. <laughs> so yes. it's a weird th- like thing when you like... I mean, let's be honest, white people are the minority in the world. It's just no one's bothered to tell us in a way we'll listen. <laughs> no, it's it's more like just the concept of it. It's, it, it, it's yeah. always been staggering to me, especially after I've moved uh, countries, uh, how much of that applies. And I'm just like, I, I don't know. Like, At least that's not me. And I don't want... That's not how I want to be known. Uh... But that aside, like, yeah, I do agree that as far as uh, optics go, it's it's not equal all around. And unfortunately, uh, TTRPG specifically, that is not a culture that is huge back home. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's slowly growing now uh, with, uh, 
you know, uh, with the economy getting better, and people having more, uh, A, more access, uh, B, more uh, disposable income where they can spend on something like a rule book and a dice, which was unthinkable uh, when I was growing up, or at least where I was growing up. And also, uh, you can't deny uh, Critical Role, like something like that. Like, I remember pre-Critical Role, I would go to uh, board game meetups, and the fact that we even had a board game meetup was mind-blowing at the time. Uh, and I would try and get them into playing D&D &D, uh, with mixed results because I was a shitty DM at that time because I was start, uh, starting out. And they didn't know what to do either because nobody had any reference points of what this is. So it was really hard to get started back then. And Critical Role comes out, and like a few years later, we have, you know, groups and uh, people getting together to actually play it. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah. But um, that was not always the case. And it's, it's quite interesting to see that shift, but it's still not big enough, to, big enough of a shift where I can say, oh, I've got my own market I can talk to. My market is still the West. Yes. Yeah, I will say, like, I learned to play tabletops in D&D, because at the time, when I started watching Critical Role, we were playing a Pathfinder game. Oh, nice. But, like, that was how I learned, was I watched other people play, uh -huh. which I just absorbed. Because for me, like, sure, I can learn a rule. But for me, the really important part about tabletop, the, the first thing you have to learn is, like, how do you behave and react around the table? Um, and I, if you can behave well at the table, if you can figure out how to fit in, I can teach you any rule. That's fine. We'll have fun figuring out these rules as we go. But, you know, and also having really good GMs to model yourself after is important. But yes, thank you. I was going to ask, like you said, you'd never heard of a, a dice with more than six sides before you were 16. So <laughs> I was eager to learn, like, how you got into this. Like, what, how, it, like... It is a smaller scene, as you said. Like, what is, is there a tabletop culture over there? How does it feel different? Like, what, how is that space shaping up? Um, okay, so <laughs> the short answer to how I discovered all this is possibly the dumbest, you know, inroad in, which is a fucking banner ad. Uh, yeah. Uh, no. Yes. <laughs> you yes. clicked on a banner ad. It said, hey, do you want to play a cool RPG? And I was like, fuck yeah, I do. Uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll elaborate because it's, it's a fun story. I had like games, playing video games, uh, and this is, we're talking the 2000s, right? Uh, playing games was essentially something that most Indian parents would have been like, you are wasting your time. You better study, otherwise... Your life is wasted. Uh, and at that same time, uh, with the economy having opened up, you know, PCs were starting to become affordable to the middle class. And if not the middle class, at least the upper middle class, or to businessmen who started opening cyber cafes or PC banks, as they're called in uh, Korea's. Uh, and so kids my age would go to those and play games. Uh, I was also a fan of Star Wars, and I, uh, through Facebook, joined a Star Wars uh, fan group, and someone there uh, that I had made friends with had mentioned uh, a browser-based RPG called, uh, what was it, Legend of the Green Dragon, I think? And so I started playing that just because, like, oh, you know, I like RPGs. I don't have a PC at home that can run an actual RPG. So mm -hmm. this is the closest I'll get. Uh, so I would be playing that. And one day, this banner ad came up saying, Dungeons and Dragons, do you want to play this? And uh, I was like, sure, let's see if it's like another browser game. And it turned out to actually just be this interactive tutorial for how to play Dungeons and Dragons physically. Uh, and it's like uh, their stock character, Ragnar, the barbarian fighter. You basically move him and you just like click on a tile and you go to a door and it says, in Dungeons and Dragons, you can listen through a door and all you have to say is you're doing it and you roll the dice and it has a made, made up dice in it. So it explained the basics, which is you take an action, you have stats, you compare your dice roll versus that stat and combat is roughly the same with an armor class and health and all that and that blew my mind i did not I, it never occurred to me that you could play and imagine 
with rules and dice. Mm -hmm. And as a little rules goblin myself, I was like, holy shit, I can create rules. So, like, I go home that day, like, just the world opened up to me. And uh, the first thing I do is create, try and recreate it with, like, D6s. So I do that, and I play it with my brother. And it was probably shitty, but he had a good time, I had a good time. And that's, and that's all that matters. Exactly. That's all that matters. And then I I never knew that you could, like, where to find the other types of dice. So I was like, fine, we'll make do. So I made, like, variations of that. Uh, like, I made a Pokemon thing. I made a Star Wars thing. And it was basically my friends and my brother were my test subjects. Uh, but one of those was actually really fun, where uh, my friends in school and I would start playing that in the back of class. So I would like smuggle dice into it with my little pen pencil box. We'd prop up our books, and then just like whispers, like "Yeah, move two tiles forward," and I'm gonna attack him. So I'm like, "Roll the die," and then we even got like felt in our pencil boxes so the dice wouldn't rattle, so we wouldn't get caught. It's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> yeah. So that's how I started, and then. I think years later, in that same group of uh, fanfic, I had mentioned uh, Dungeons and Dragons was, in, so I was like, "Oh, well, here's a link," and it was basically a download link to like all the 3.5 books. And I was like, "What the hell?" So I started studying, <laughs> but the wrong stuff. Uh, so my grades weren't great, but I at least understood 3.5 a lot better. And but I never <laughs> That's had. That's what's important. Yeah, exactly. And I never had anyone to play with back then because, again, not too many people understood or knew mm -hmm. and that with D&D specifically, you needed the die. And I think it was when I was on, in my first job that a new designer had joined and he had uh, just moved back to India from uh, finishing a course with VFS. And he had come back and, of course, he had his D&D dice because he had learned how to play back there. And he's like, yeah, I can DM. And I'm like, oh my god. And I get to so, play? I get to yeah. be a player? And I'm like, you have the dice? Like, that was the big thing for me. I was like, oh, what? Oh. You? And so, uh, yeah, so he, he basically DM'd. I actually got to play the rules proper. And he's one of the co-creators on uh, this as well. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, that's that's essentially how I discovered D&D, &D, which is the weirdest inlet ever. Uh, yeah. oh, and because you asked about like what the scene is like, yes. um, it's a bit more vibrant now. Um, like post CR and especially the pandemic kind of really helped uh, kind of ossify a bit of that uh, community. And we have uh, two or three uh, Discord groups that like work together. So I uh, I play and do my uh, play tests on a Discord group called the Pigeon Killers or TPK uh, for the fun. Uh, they're fantastic. Do you have meta pigeons too? Uh, they, I don't have a race of pigeons yet, but honestly, no, I meta pigeon. Meta, they do, they do do Excellent. stuff like that, and all, all their like homebrew stuff that they run always has a pigeon bad guy, so it's it's a, <laughs> it's a running joke at this point. Uh, but a shout out to them because they've been super supportive. Because I reached out like a year ago when I wanted to do playtests outside of my group. Mm -hmm. And they're just like, hell yeah. And they all just jumped on. I, I've run a bunch of playtests with people there. And uh, yeah, so it's the community's growing. But I, I'd say that I don't, on a whole, we're probably like in the what, like thousands, like not even, you know, tens of thousands, just thousands. Yeah. yeah from your earlier comment, JD said, so uh, Tejas has been doing game dev since they were 16. <laughs> roundabout yeah <laughs> found your calling very young yeah <laughs> I, I, so, I i will admit that like i showed off some of the designs and that did help me land my first job <laughs> awesome i spend so much time lecturing people who are trying to break into game dev i'm like if you ran a wow guild or if you have run a two year long D, &D campaign put that on your resume that will yes. mean a thing i promise you don't like Oh my god, you made my favorite game when I was five? That's not necessarily gonna help, but no, I run a I ran a five-year D and D campaign, levels yeah. one to twenty. Yeah, they're gonna wanna talk to you, I promise. Exactly. And, and if you can put in specifics like, hey, uh, I hold brood a setting or I hold brood rules, and 
items and or like enough that you can tell people that you created stuff and you were mod. It's essentially modding, right? What did you mod and how did you mod? So I would love to back up just a little bit, um, only because we I know we're about an hour in, but we got some some new folks hanging out in chat. And we've been sure. dropping the links, but like. Give us, again, just give us your little elevator pitch of exactly what Blungeon is so that folks can kind of hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Cool. Uh, so, oh man, I wish I had like a one-liner just written up for me uh, so that I could read off of it. It'd be easier. Uh, Blungeon That's your assignment after this. I know. Uh, my elevator pitch. But yeah, uh, Bludgeon is a D20-focused tactics uh, kind of... Uh, a tactics inclined uh, TTRPG system. Uh, our main focus is to take the, your uh, class archetypes and make sure your mechanics mirror that. And so you're not just saying and role playing what you do, but what you actually do with your dice and actions actually bleeds into your role play. So this takes the form of bards actually feel like a bard rather than. I'm a bard and I cast this spell and the wizard's like, cool, I'm a wizard and I cast the same spell. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if you're a bard, you'll be running around uh, casting little, uh, essentially our version of cantrips uh, and building up flow, which is their power. And once you have enough flow, you cast a power note, which is an amazing spell. And uh, sorcerers are unstable energy uh, generators. So every time your spells go awry, uh, you generate instability, and if you have enough instability, you kind of have a little magical explosion that hurts you and everyone around you. My oh Solarian does that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure, like, you could convert a lot of your, uh, like, characters from other systems into this without too much of an issue, or too much of a loss of, uh, yeah. your functionality. Also, I think my, uh, text thing has stopped working again, so I might need a new link. Oh, well, yeah, it stopped in the middle of your talk. How much fun <laughs> is that? When did um, I say Doughboy? <laughs> like. uh, I have to remember which tab. You there you go. Thank you for pointing that out because I did not notice. No worries. Let's see when you're back. And while Kay is sorting that, um, one question I, I do uh, want to ask, especially since um, our crowd has a lot of people who are building and trying to participate in things uh, as well. What would you say is are, are the biggest challenges you faced in building this system? Uh, honestly, a lot of my challenges have been outside the actual building of the system. Um, before it's, you go too much further, hold on. Yeah. Um, oh, there, it's behaving now. Okay, yeah, uh, I was keeping an eye on it. Um, for me, like, building the thing was fairly easy. Um, building the content for it is a bit, that, that also takes effort. And uh, the way I look at it is, again, uh, probably sound like, a, uh, like I'm kind of harping on the same point, but it's if you have your core system working and it's modular, Adding stuff on is the easy part. It's more just make sure it's uh, like you're building extra content and layering on to a, a solid core. Uh, the hardest part for me is uh, because I come in from like, like most of my life has been with video games and game development. I do feel like an outsider in the TTRPG space. Half the time, I don't know what the conversations are about, and whenever there's drama, I'm just like, I don't know. I don't have an opinion. Um, but it's also making connections. Uh, one of the hard things about uh, being uh, in India, especially, was I, I don't have anyone to, uh, or anywhere to go where I can talk to people about this. And I mean in terms of conventions, in terms of meetups and get-togethers. Uh, now that I'm in the UK, I'm taking this opportunity and going to uh, the UK Games Expo for the first time. Uh, not presenting, just at least absorb what that's like. Mm -hmm. But a lot of creators 
uh, would have access to that, right? At least if you're living in any Western country. Uh, you have access to conventions where you can go talk to people, either showcase your work, or uh, you can, you have uh, game stores that you can go to and playtest physically with people. Uh, and that's a huge advantage over not having any of that, pretty much. So for me, the biggest challenge has been uh, finding... Uh, avenues to like talk to people and just get be known that I exist and that this system exists and uh, this is what it does. Yeah, and playtesting is so important because you can sit there and think left, right, up, down, backwards and sideways about all of your mechanics and the moment you hand it to someone, they're going to be like, what if I do this? And it breaks everything. Always, always. I have, uh, like, the book does not show all my failures. It just shows the successful <laughs> mechanics. Uh, there's years of, like, you know, attempts and, you know, things that I was so, so confident about. Like, oh, yeah, this is perfect. This is going to work. And then my friend plays it. It's like, I had the worst session ever. I hated how I played. And I was like, oh, okay. They go home and then, like, just rework it and be like, let's try again. Oh, that's so rough. Rex asks, would a smartphone app help with getting games out in India? There are smartphone apps. And I will say that D&D Beyond, uh, because D&D is more or less the monolith in this space, has made a huge impact uh, for helping people uh, get into the hobby. But it's not just that. It you, you have to account for do they have the time do they have the, the references a lot of the crowd that plays uh, D&D in India now uh, came in during the pandemic or just before the pandemic but preceding Critical Role uh, there are people who played before but uh, they're much but they're few and far between at least as far as I've met them uh, it, it's hard to also find each other. Um, so there's there's a lot that goes into it. And the reason I mentioned economics earlier is also you have to realize that it's also a growing economy. Uh, now people have, like I said, the people have disposable income where they're like, yeah, I can. It's normal to spend on small luxuries for yourself and to have hobbies. When I was a kid growing up, that was not the case. Um, yeah. You had to study. You had to study hard uh, because your parents obviously wanted you to have a better life than they did and so on and so forth. It was a very different environment. Uh, so the fact that I got into games is honestly just because I have very open-minded parents. <laughs> without, we, Honestly, without them you know, rooting for me, I would not be doing this or I would not be here. I'd probably be you know, in some other kind of job that pays really well or uh, is not as creatively inclined uh, and there are so many kids in India I'm sure my age and probably older who has uh, the uh, the spark and the ability to do creative work or, and more who mm -hmm. just due to circumstance couldn't I remember when and for, this is a bit of a tangent but when the Netflix version of The Little Prince came out um, it's a it is a wonderful it's a French book uh, originally a children's story about a, a it's a fictional story about a little prince but they took it and they did kind of a modern adaptation where it's the guy who found the little prince is now old and he uh -huh. meets this young Asian girl uh, who's his neighbor who's got the very strict Asian mom who's like no you have to grow up and you have to be like you have to study and it's all about finding imagination and like having the freedom. And I remember like watching it and finishing it and having like tears in my eyes and just being like, this is gonna save someone's <laughs> life. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not easy. Like uh, th there are a lot more realities that people have to face. And yeah. even with TTRPGs, the, the bulk of the players in India, I will say, and okay, I may be wrong, but from well, whatever observational data I have, they're all in major cities, right? Metropolitan mm -hmm. cities. Yeah. They're not going to be coming out from uh, tier two, tier three cities because there's the, the, 
you're, the realities of your life are very different. Yeah. And just having three hours to sit down yeah. and spend is not something a lot of people have. Yeah. And even if they do, like, it's, you do that in different ways. Uh, people is, would hang out. Obviously, they would. But the way they'd hang out is they'd go out, go play cricket, or go out and have food, a huge food culture, especially my state. Um, and those were more socially acceptable ways. That's the other mm -hmm. key thing is that every culture has socially acceptable ways to showcase how you're having fun or uh, how you're spending your time. Some things that are alien, obviously, will take time to become normalized. Yeah. Um, so what is next for this project? Are you looking to continue adding? Are you looking to do some kind of fundraising? Like, what's we're, your next big thing? We're thinking of fundraising. Uh, the thing is, like, all of us have full-time jobs. So whatever we do is... Whenever we have a moment to breathe in between uh, yeah. all our lives and all our lives have also kind of in the last year and a half, like it's hilarious because we made the decision to work on this and literally within six months, all of us got jobs outside of India. So, you know, life has been very crazy as we've been juggling, you know, all the transitions, new cultures and new worlds and all that and new studios and all that so yeah it's it's been difficult but we would like to fundraise because we want to get more art clearly there's a lot more to do uh the rule book itself is actually more or less complete uh, the core rules at least so the free demo that's up on itch has two of five major umbrella mechanical systems right it's arcade and martial the remaining three are chakra uh primal and divine and those offer more class options so that's probably another 120 another 150 pages worth of content there wow. and so yeah it's, it's a lot of upgrade trees <laughs> uh but those will be coming out in the coming months uh i when i get time i'm working on lore as well uh adding a, a bit more in terms of uh helping people create uh characters that live in the world uh, better because we never had to think about that because that's it, it, we created it but it, one of the things I've realized watching people play is uh, yeah, uh, people have asked for this and I need to work on it so working on lore and getting the rest of the stuff out and eventually when we have time to actually build a Kickstarter page or whatever we'll try that so we can get art and you know, uh, if things work out, even a physical book, which would be like a dream come true. Well, full disclosure, David and I have not run Kickstarters, but we have spent time researching and we have talked to a whole lot of people who have run yeah. Kickstarters and would be happy to offer any advice if you like it. Oh, I can happy. also say, um, just from chat alone, uh, if you would ever like to do a play test or a streamed game, we would love to have it. Oh, um, I'm okay. speaking on behalf of you, David, but... Yep. Um, you know, if, it's... if Kay says something and she's speaking for me, she's right 100% of the time. All right. I, but... I honestly wouldn't mind it as well, because it, like, it's a joy to see people kind of discover the system. Um, yeah. I, I remember the first time uh, I... I play tested it uh, especially play tested without pre-made character sheets and people are going through the rule book and they're just like wait what if i do this and take this does that mean i can also do this i was like yeah and then the the theory crafting started and we spent like i spent two hours just what listening to people theory craft which is which is so awesome because that's joy. that's kind of what i want yeah yeah you, you took this thing that I thought of, and then you're taking this and doing what I hoped you would do. Exactly. They also broke the system, so I had to patch it later, but that, that was <laughs> right. that was part of the fun. <laughs> yeah, Rex says that means you are all on the right path. Aw, oh, thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, every, every plan, everybody has a plan until they meet their players. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's, yeah, I'm, I'm sure, like, one thing I'm trying to keep an eye on is, like, if there's anything massively broken because I've tried to design it so that everybody has moments of power so it's not 
you have that one moment where you're like, yeah, this is where I shine. But if you're, you know, shining all the time, then you're just overshadowing everyone else. So I, I, I'll, I'll figure out the balance with time. Uh, I like to think about it as a live ops game because that's my background. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we are approaching the end of our time. Um, any final thoughts or things you would like to share? Just topics you would like to discuss as we kind and of wind answer down. questions that we did not think to ask. Right. Uh, I'm blanking, but that's probably also because of the time. Uh, but yeah. if yeah, if if the chat has more questions, I'd be happy to just you know wax poetic about other stuff. Yeah. Um, chat shout out now is your chance. But while while they're coming up with questions, um, I th I've got nothing more to say. It's like. I'm really happy that we have this out there. Uh, I'm trying to, you know, spread the word wherever I can. And I would love it if people actually tried out the system and let me know, you know, uh, how it went, if they had trouble reading the book, you know, so I know how to edit it to make it read better. Uh, yeah, whatever feedback and criticism I can get is going to be amazing. And there's nothing you could say that would be too harsh because that's what feedback is. And is the best way to DM you on Twitter? Is there an email? What's what's the best way to send you feedback? Um, at the moment, I'd say DM me on Twitter uh, at Tactics and Chai. That's just an end. Uh, underneath? If, uh, that way. Underneath his yeah. name. Nope, that way. Underneath his name. <laughs> and uh, so that's the best way uh, to get in touch with me. Uh, we're probably going to start Discord in some time. And when I do, it'll be announced on Twitter anyway. So, yeah. Uh, eventually um we got a, a chat message since we're nearing the end hi tejas from neelish did i say that right yeah yeah that's he's one of the co-creators oh <laughs> amazing thank watch. you for hanging out and thank you for hanging out hey neelish thanks for, the same thing twice, but i was trying to do a chat command and my brain just didn't behave <laughs> Um, but yeah, JD says, uh, I love these streams for introducing me to new cool stuff. Oh. Yeah, we oh, are fun. very fortunate that we have so many creators who will come and talk to us about what they're doing and be open and upfront because we do occasionally ask some difficult questions, but I think they're fun, difficult questions. I like to think I could be wrong. What do I know? And, and for anyone watching, we only invite cool people on. Like, oh, if somebody's yeah. working on something that is cool and interesting and engaging, like, people who are lame or building things that are boring, we, we don't we don't bother with those. Yeah, there's, there's a certified cool list that you have to uh, yeah. meet, match. There's, there's, there's a test. whole questionnaire I had to fill out, you know, hmm. send pictures. It's very to comprehensive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right. Uh, Rex says the game looks great. Awesome. So yes, um, thank you again. It looks like everyone is just devolving into praise. Um, we have been dropping in the links. Thank you again for checking it out, y'all. And thank you as always, chat, for hanging out. You make this stream so much more worth it. Uh, thank you, Tejas, for sharing not just your game, but your experiences and the things that inspired you because yeah, we could sit here and talk games all day, but like the people behind them, like we play these games to explore ourselves and to explore our characters, but also to get to know other people and to get to know other settings. Um, you know, they they say the the man who cannot read only lives one life. Well, yeah. The yeah. person who does. So, so true with TTRPGs as well. So thank you for sharing. And um, I I would love to do a play test at some point if you sure. are ever up for it. Maybe when it's not so late for you. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's, that's the important part. For sure. Um, I, well, I look forward to doing something like that. And thanks for having me, guys. And chat for staying around and asking all those questions. Absolutely. Uh, David, who the heck is you and what the heck is we doing here? Hi, I'm David. Every w Welcome to the... I mean, welcome. There are some people who joined late. Welcome to the Chaotic Pre Wholesome Presents table talk show wow i can use words where every week we talk about ttrpg stuff how to be a better player how to be a better gm all with a focus on intersectionality and inclusion so that everybody can have a good time um 
I'm Kay. I'm your other co-host. I will be streaming Pokemon on Thursday. You can find Emergency Power Podcast on Wednesday. Trading cards are up for grabs if I can ever get them centered. Just let us know. We'll be happy to send them out. David will be streaming Overwatch on Friday. Uh, we're working on stuff. If you have someone or if you want to come on, let us know. We'd love to have you on. Tejas, thank you again. It has been a treat. Um, Blungeon looks amazing. Looks like it plays amazing. And uh, oh, yay. Matt said requested his cards today. Sweet. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, we hope we can help spread the word and we hope we get to learn more about this in the very near future. Any any final thoughts? Any closeouts before I flip us over to find um, someone to raid? Just thank you. And uh, yeah, we'll talk about the play, uh, play test and all. Sounds like a good time. Amazing. All right. I think we're going to go check out Xanderific, who is playing Legend of Rin. Zelda Oracle of Seasons. Rin. Oh, is Rin? Rin! Rin. 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 Visit Rin. My friend Rin is doing art, and she is an incredible artist and does stuff for League of Legends. Uh, in addition to her day job. Uh... So, thank you all again. Chat, remember, be good to yourselves, be excellent to others. Thank you for hanging out, and we will see you all very soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.